And I want to say uh, thank you to Catherine and all of the Cashman Center for making this evening possible. Um, uh, I hope that this will be helpful, meaningful, fun, and a dialogue. And, uh, and um, also to panelists, they, uh, and, um, as they bring a passion, they bring experience, they bring a lot to this. And uh, so we're looking forward to a really good dialogue. Now, the risk is I'm a physician. <laughs> the risk is that it could end up being a monologue. And I'm going to trust friends in the audience who stand up and just go, mm -hmm, if that's going to be the case. Um, but we are here tonight either as cancer survivors or co-survivors. And I'm wearing the, the pink because this is October, and, um, and I'm wearing the white because this is the co-survivors. And in particular, it is a tough role to be a co-survivor, just like it's a tough role to be a survivor. And I really want to, to discuss both of these in some detail tonight. I, um, the co-survivor and the survivorship, uh, co-survivors are there for information, for emotional support, and for practical help. And I hope tonight is going to be informative and give you some guidance on how, um, how to provide emotional support. Because all of us want to help and just kind of, oh, what does it take to do that? Um, and I also want this to be, uh, have some nice practical, informative things. We've got lots of time for dialogue. No one's going to go away disappointed, I hope. We'll hang around to, for questions. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about the flow. And that is, uh, I want to talk for um, a few minutes uh, on a couple of different topics. Then we're going to sit down, and the, the questions that you wrote down on your uh, cards to begin with will then generate the dialogue uh, here, and that Jenna will uh, moderate and bring in as a, uh, as a, as a appropriate uh, kind of uh, ongoing questions, concerns. Hopefully, I'm going to provide some kind of um, stimulus to, that will generate questions on your part. If I'm really provocative, that will be a good thing. And so uh, that is my hope. OK, so people say, Plotnikoff, are you going to talk about alternative medicine? And I want to say, no, I'm not anti-anything. I'm talking about what's next. I'm going to talk about kind of make reference to next generation medicine. In my clinical practice uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota Natural Medicine, or in Minneapolis, Minnesota Personalized Medicine, the strong focus on the new sciences of genomics, metabolomics, microbiomics. We can get into those if you're interested. And additionally, I wanted to introduce myself as a bridger, and that is um, uh, east and west, science and spirituality, um, heart and mind, body and soul. That's what I, uh, I feel passionately about. And it's really not alternative. It's really and or plus. And, um, and so we were, I want to honor and revere all the best of conventional medicine and maybe take it a little bit further. But cancer, oh my goodness, what a, a challenging thing. It kind of throws us into this vortex. So I should tell you a little bit about um, the messenger before I share something about the message. And um, um, it was a very conscious choice for me to go to divinity school before medical school. I had won an essay contest sophomore year of college. It took me to the first international conference on human values in London. And there I met leaders of the hospice movement. And this was 1981, and hospice was a pretty radical concept in the United States. Most people never heard the word before. And I found it very moving. And I said, wow, um, compassionate care. Uh, um, and so it was very, very inspiring. And I thought, well, shouldn't this be part of all of medicine? But I said, well, I came back to Minnesota, started volunteering, worked with great nurses, great chaplains, and I made a very conscious decision to go to divinity school before medical school. My parents were so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> it was, really, was kind of like, I, I said, I'm, I'm going to go to Harvard. And they said, what? I said, oh, I really want to study with Henry Nowen and uh, Diana Eck. And, and they go, what? I said, oh, I really like to be on some time in the East Coast. And you're like, what? It kept going on and on. And they said, oh, Greg, 
<laughs> if you really want a master's for medical school, why don't you do something practical like biochemistry or immunology? <coughs> well, in fact, it turned out to be the most practical thing ever uh, for me. I trained as a hospital chaplain and then started medical school. I went from being um, uh, in small groups where we discuss concepts and the history of ideas into a large classroom where someone went blah, 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 blah. Here are the following facts you need to know. We won't tell you why outside of context. And I discovered some incredibly important things were missing from the curriculum. Healing. Suffering. It's like nutrition. Death and dying. All kinds of things were missing from the curriculum. And so, in fact, there was a curriculum, there was a missing curriculum, and we discovered there's a hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is, number one, is nutrition has no relationship to health. And I can't tell you how many physicians tell me that today. No, there's no connection between what you eat and, and your state of your health. Um, second thing is there's a very interesting definition of what is normal and who is normal. Hmm. Very political questions. So back then, what is normal was a straight white male, capitalist Christian, English-speaking, uh, Northern European heritage, approximately age 23. And as I looked around my med school classroom, that's who I saw. <laughs> um, third uh, uh, issue that uh, came up was that there are no real ethical dilemmas. There are just things waiting a technical fix. And if it doesn't work the first time, put more and more of technology at play and you'll get to it. There's a big difference between a technical fix and, and um, working around some other things. The technical fix is you walk into a dark room, where's the light switch? And it's kind of a... Um, an adaptive response would be, you walk into a room and there's no light switch, what now do you do? Now, nurses understand this really well, but it's been part missing from the physician curriculum. Likewise, back then, physicians were seen as self-sufficient virtuosos. That was the model. We carry it all on our shoulders. There's no such thing as a team. If there is a team, then the style is command and control. And so I rejected all of those ideas, and so we worked very hard to create a shadow curriculum. And so since starting med school in 1985, I've been part of the shadow curriculum of sorts. But I strongly believe in a healthy body, and a healthy mind, and a healthy spirit. And we'll talk about those, uh, I'm sure, uh, tonight. One new dimension I want to do is talk about a healthy community. Ed Ellinger, our current um, Commissioner of Health, shared this um, quote from Wendell Berry. Um, the community, is a in, in the fullest sense, is the smallest unit of health. To speak of the health of an isolated individual is a contradiction in terms. So it's very interesting. I spent six years as a professor at Keio Medical School in Tokyo. And I had gone for two years to study traditional Japanese herbal medicine because medical students there were being taught to prescribe ancient multi-herb formulas that are approved by their FDA, covered by the National Health Plan, and widely used, including in oncology. And we knew nothing about them. I said, so I'm going to go learn. I planned to go for two years. And discovered to really learn, I actually need to really learn the Japanese language. So, that, so I end up spending six or so years there. But one of the things that I'm going to share with you about this is that in the Japanese language, every character has a beautiful poem in it. The simplest, one of the simplest characters is this for person. It was described, and I said, tell me, how does this, and it kind of looks like a person, I think, but how did this come to be a person? And without, a, uh, without any variation across Japan, people said, ah, a person is, yes, a, a one, but they always have support. 
I said this is very different than autonomy in the U.S., where we do, where, uh, as um, Kant said, once humanity is defined by one's degree of independence from the wills of others. But then I found in Japan, once humanity is defined by one's degree of connection with others. So I come back to this theme of community, co-survivorship. We're in this together. The white and the pink. So in Japan, I had you know, imagine all kinds of new images, all kinds of new th uh, uh, things that reflect a culture very different from ours. And yes, we have this character, but I want to share with you also something about the language that I think by stepping out of our comfort zone, we can see something new and important in our own culture and we can draw upon it. So if we take the character for person and tie it with the character for tree, the two things come together in a new word. Like what is the connection between person and tree? It's rest. So everything is, a, is kind of a jeopardy question. Now I share this with you, we're going to get to practical stuff, but I share this with you because it opens up all kinds of new things. Um, you know, it's kind of under the tree, is understood. And so it's this idea that um, what I want to share with you is that truth sometimes is not found in measurement, one of the hidden curriculums of the medical school. Truth is only found in measurement. As one uh, the chairman of one department said, I wouldn't believe anything unless it was proven by a double-blind randomized controlled trial. <laughs> and she was serious. I said, oh, excuse me, there's never been a randomized controlled trial of prunes for constipation. <laughs> she didn't respond to that. But. All right, so getting to the heart of the matter. Here's an interesting character. It looks like something from the state fair. You know, my marshmallows on a stick. In fact, this is the character meaning to pierce. Now, um, it's used with things like related to barbecues and things like that. So you say, oh, you know, Japanese isn't such a tough language. And then if we add the character for the metaphoric heart, kind of a metaphoric heart, the poetic heart, the soul, perhaps, we put the two together, we have the new character. And this new character is the word for patient. A patient is someone whose heart has been pierced. Or, a patient is someone who pierces our heart. So this speaks to why, as survivors and co-survivors, uh, community is so important, and why tonight the theme running through all our things is going to be coming back to heart.